The federally funded President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, provides HIV prevention, treatment, and education around the world. It's the biggest commitment of any nation to fight a single disease. It's estimated to have saved 25 million lives since President George W. Bush launched it in 2003. Throughout its existence, PEPFAR has enjoyed broad bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. That is, until this year. A small group of conservative House Republicans is blocking legislation to reauthorize PEPFAR. They say the Biden administration is using it to promote abortion overseas. PEPFAR supporters say there is no evidence to back that up. In September, President Bush wrote an op-ed in The Washington Post urging Congress to reauthorize the program. He wrote, there is no program more pro-life than one that has saved more than 25 million lives. Jennifer Cates is senior vice president and director of global health and HIV policy at KFF. Jennifer, let's start with the basics. What does PEPFAR do and where does it do it? So PEPFAR, the global AIDS response of the U.S. government, is a very large, it's the largest program uh, in global health that the U.S. has and one of the largest in the world. And it provides funding support to many countries around the world, about 50, to launch and deliver HIV services, whether that's antiretroviral treatment, prevention, social supports, education, working with countries, working with partners on the ground. And it's widely known as one of the most successful programs in the world. As you said, it's saving 25 million lives. And our analyses have also showed that it's had even broader impacts beyond HIV. What are the things about it that has made it so successful and so effective? When it was launched, it was launched, uh, you know, with lot with incredible bipartisan support, and having that bipartisan support has has really um, lent the program the kind of uh, uh, support and ongoing stability that it's needed. In addition, uh, the program has been funded pretty well with by Congress, and also one of the unique things about it is it's been very focused on data and metrics. So it has actually made changes over time when its new treatments have come on board, when it's seen that it needs to focus on a different area. So it's very uh, driven by the science, driven by the data, and a very large commitment that involves multiple agencies across the U.S. government. You say it's gone beyond HIV and AIDS. During the COVID pandemic, would, did it use some of its organization and infrastructure to, to, to work on that? So during COVID, when essentially the world shut down, the operations in countries where PEPFAR is also had to shut down uh, for, the, for the large part. What PEPFAR was able to do, though, they were able to use that infrastructure to respond to COVID. Because the infrastructure is there, the U.S. has already developed it in many, many countries. And it was an incredible example of taking something that where the investment was HIV-specific and being able to build on that. Now, the opposition to this, uh, to PEPFAR, uh, reauthorizing PEPFAR on Capitol Hill, is being led by Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey, a longtime ardent foe of abortion. He's now chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee that has jurisdiction over PEPFAR. And listen to how he defends or explains his opposition. I strongly supported PEPFAR when it was created in 2003, and I was the sponsor of the reauthorization of PEPFAR in 2018. Regrettably, it has been reimagined, hijacked by the Biden administration to empower pro-abortion international NGOs, deviating from its life-affirming work. What do you say to that? Yes, so, uh, Representative Smith mentioned uh, that he was a supporter, or has been a supporter of PEPFAR. He really has been, and the, the program has been reauthorized three times. This would be its fourth. I think what has happened is the larger politics in the United States around abortion and the partisan differences between Republicans and Democrats have sort of taken over what has been a very bipartisan uh, discussion. I think the important piece to know, though, is there's several U.S. laws that actually restrict the use of U.S. funding for abortion. So PEPFAR doesn't fund abortion. It never has. It does. There's no evidence that it has. This is really a broader issue around differences uh, between the current administration's views on abortion and choice and that of those who are opposed to abortion. And specifically, he's complaining about the Biden administration's repeal of what's called the Mexico City Protocol, not to use any funds to any group that provides abortion. When it's in place, and it's always been put in place by Republican presidents through an executive action, and then it's been rescinded or removed by Democratic presidents through executive action, is a policy that says when uh, the U.S. is providing foreign aid to other organizations, to foreign NGOs, 
um, non-governmental organizations. It cannot provide any of that funding to organizations that use their own money or any other money, non-U.S. money, for abortion-related activities that are prohibited, uh, that even are legal in their country but may be prohibited under U.S. law. So basically saying, we're not going to give you money for abortion because we, we can't fund abortion, but we won't give you money if you do anything else related to abortion. Now, PEPFAR is established in permanent law. So what difference is it, will it make if it doesn't get reauthorized? Right. There's essentially two kinds of laws, reauthorizing laws and appropriations. And we always focus a lot on the money. That's the appropriation side. But there's these laws called authorizing laws or reauthorizing laws. Those create programs or continue programs or structure them or have requirements on them. PEPFAR was authorized as a permanent part of U.S. law. It doesn't end as long as Congress continues to fund it. So that's the good news. However, there are some requirements and specifications within the authorization, its reauthorization, that do end, and they did on September 30th. So those were essentially uh, requirements on how the government, how the program should fund certain things, and those are no longer requirements. This is a real uh, symbolic departure from its past, and I think that's the main uh, aspect right now that most are focused on. By getting to a point where there can't be a bipartisan agreement to reauthorize it, and what message that might send on the ground into other partner countries. Jennifer Cates of KFF, thank you very much. Thank you.